Hello, I'm Brian Mallison, pastor of Christ Lutheran Church, Visalia, California. Our worship theme for this uh, month of August has been Unexpected Heroes Live Here. You know, when we read the Bible, we read stories of amazing faith, often about people we don't even know their name. Today, Vicar Havala Forgi will bring us a message reflecting upon one of these nameless individuals about this guy who lives in a cemetery. It's a powerful sermon that speaks to not only how an encounter with Jesus changed his life, but also how one can change our lives as well. Unexpected heroes. Well, they do live in the Bible, but they also live among us. God bless you in worship today. We gather for worship in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
We Lutheran Christians have a rich history of beginning our worship services by confessing our sin and our brokenness, believing that when we come into the presence of God, we do so with humility and truthfulness, seeking not only to be reminded that we are in need of a God of forgiveness, but to actually receive that forgiveness. Please join with me in prayer. Holy God, in as much as we try to do the right things, speak the right words, and think the right thoughts, we confess that we easily default to ways and words and attitudes that are contrary to your desire for us. You desire that we would live healthy lives, free from damaging behavior and free from hurtful relationships. You also desire that we would abide with you and not stray from your presence, but we fail. And so God, in our brokenness, we ask for your restorative grace that you might forgive us and that we might forgive others and we might forgive ourselves and that we might have peace to go from this moment into right living. This we ask in Jesus' name, amen. While we were yet in our sin, Christ died for us. Good news that I share. The best news of all is that because of Christ Jesus, your sins are forgiven. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Hi, my name is Patty Enders, and I just wanted to share a story that reminded me of how much God loves us and cares for us every day. A few weeks ago, my husband and I were driving to pick up my car um, downtown Visalia after we'd had some work done to it. And we realized it's a few minutes before noon, let's um, get something to eat. And because we're downtown, we stopped at Taylor's Hot Dogs. So we're standing in the parking lot of Taylor's Hot Dogs and we're getting ready to order. And I look around and um, everybody's wearing a mask and we're standing six feet apart and it's hot because it's July. And I just suddenly get so discouraged because I remembered that our um, COVID numbers keep going up despite everything we're doing to try to bring them down. And I think about all the events and ceremonies and gatherings that have been not only postponed, but just canceled. And I think to myself, how much worse is it gonna get? and I just get sad. And right at that moment, I hear music. But not just music, bells, chimes, it's beautiful, it's, it's just glorious. And it took me a second, but I remembered the Presbyterian Church. They had a bell tower, and they used to play music at noon every, every day, and I guess they still do, because there it was, it was gorgeous, it was beautiful. And um, the music is like swirling, and I feel like it's almost lifting me up, it's so pretty. And the tune was, Great is Thy Faithfulness. And as the tune goes on, I'm hearing the words in my head. And it's, um, all I have needed, thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. All I've needed, not everything I want or everything that's convenient for me, but all I've needed. And at that moment, I needed encouragement, God provided. So I know that when I need wisdom or strength, God will provide that as well. And I was just so very thankful that I had that reminder of how much God loves me and cares for me and works in my life every day. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest ray, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the 
sweetest friend, but only trust in Jesus' name. Christ alone, cornerstone, weak made strong in the Savior's love. Through the storm, He is Lord, Lord of all. When darkness seems to hide His face, Today's reading comes from Mark chapter 5 verses 1 through 13 and 18 through 20. They came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gerasens. And when he had stepped out of the boat, immediately a man out of the tombs with an unclean spirit met him. He lived among the tombs. No one could restrain him anymore, even with a chain. For he had often been restrained with shackles and chains, but the chains were wrenched apart and the shackles he broke in pieces, and no one had the strength to subdue him. Night and day, among the tombs and on the mountains, he was always howling and bruising himself with stones. When he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and bowed before him, and he shouted at the top of his voice, What have you to do with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? I adjure you by God, do not torment me. For he had said to him, Come out of the man, you unclean spirit. Then Jesus asked him, What is your name? He replied, my, my name is Legion, for we are many. He begged him earnestly not to send them out of the country. Now there on the hillside a great herd of swine was feeding, and the unclean spirits begged him, Send us into the swine, let us enter them. So he gave them permission, and the unclean spirits came out and entered the swine, and the herd numbering about 2,000 rushed down the steep bank into the sea and were drowned in the sea. As he was getting into the boat, the man who had been possessed by demons begged him that he might be with him. But Jesus refused and said to him, Go home to your friends and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and what mercy he has shown you. And he went away and began to proclaim in the Decapolis uh, how much Jesus had done for him and everyone was amazed. Here ends today's reading. When I was a young teenager, 
I used to walk about a mile and a half to work at a stable several times a week. It was a really nice wooded walk on quiet roads and it passed a cemetery. Not a creepy horror flick cemetery, but kind of a pretty one. Small and well kept, a few evergreens and flowering trees. But the remarkable thing about Cromwell Cemetery at that time was that almost every time I walked by, there was a certain man there. He had a lawn chair and he'd be reading a book or a newspaper or he'd have a small meal spread out and he was always in the same place underneath the same tree. I'm sure that he had a home where he went to sleep, but as far as I could see, he lived in the cemetery. He lived among the tombs. I wondered and I speculated. Well, I never talked to him because teenage Havila wouldn't have done that like present Havila would. But sometimes I would wave to him as I went past. He'd wave back, but he didn't smile. Why was he there? I always kind of thought that he had lost someone and that he was lonely and that being in the cemetery helped him to feel less alone. But at the same time, I feel sad for him that he was spending all of his time in the safe cemetery of memory. He may have felt comforted in that place of death and everyone grieves in their own time and according to their own journey. But in some ways, as long as he lived there, he was living death too. There was perhaps no way for something new to invade that quiet, resigned hopelessness. Well, grace and peace to you from God, our Creator, and from Jesus Christ, the Lord of life, who today we follow into a graveyard. Before this moment, he was teaching beside a beach to a crowd, and then he was done, and he told the disciples, let's get away from these people, and they get on a boat. They get out far enough to be out of reach of help, and a storm comes up, and the winds come up, the waves get high, and this storm is no joke. Mark writes that the waves are coming up over the sides, and the boat is getting swamped, and they're going to sink. The disciples are freaking out, and then it seems to occur to them that Jesus is not doing his share to bail and try to keep this thing afloat. And so they find him, sound asleep, on a cushion in the back of the boat how he was asleep through the commotion and the water and the disciples shouting to each other is as much a mystery to them as to us, of course. But he gets up and he stretches. He tells the storm to knock it off. He gets a little cheeky with them for their lack of faith. And then they end up on the other side of the water here in Gentile territory, as if the storm wasn't bad enough. Jesus steps off the boat into a graveyard and immediately is confronted by an unnamed man who lives among the tombs. Now we're told that this man is a bit of an emotional mess. He isn't reading books or eating quiet meals or waving to strangers who walk by. But like my friend in the Cromwell Cemetery, we're invited to wonder about why he is here. People would visit graves in the ancient world just as we do now. And I don't imagine this graveyard to be a horror film set, but another nice and kept place. Maybe just a little bit like this one. But this man is different. He lives here. Why? Writers in the ancient world use the same word and concept for demon as for ghost. Was this man tormented by the loss of many that he loved? Was he trapped with the ghosts of his own past or trauma? Was he confronting a world like we do every day that's grief-stricken and terrified and hopeless and he just didn't know how to do that anymore? We can see his pain. He bruises himself with stones and we can recognize from today's standpoint that self-harm can be an attempt to have control in a life that feels otherwise chaotic. He seems stuck in a loop that he can't escape. But when Jesus comes, he doesn't ask for help. The unnamed man recognizes Jesus. He bows down even, and he asks, what could you possibly have to do with me, Jesus? And he even begs, don't torment me. This man's demons 
they see Jesus and they just start howling. Jesus' very presence ignites a conflict. Everything Jesus is and does and has ever done is at odds with this man's world. A world of demons and catastrophe and violence and possession and self-destruction and hopelessness. And we don't have to live in a graveyard to recognize our world, our lives in all of that. Maybe what the world expects from us is contrary to our core values and beliefs. Maybe our graveyard is inside us. A past sin or shame that's reaching into our present. Voices of others that are defining who we are. Pain that we would rather bury than address. So we may also beg Jesus, don't torment me. Even when we are in pain, living in a world of death, we can be afraid to have something different. Our past and our present, as individuals and as the whole of humanity, can have a power over us that can seem like it possesses us against our will. Jesus is in conflict with that world. The primary theme, I think, in the whole of the Gospel of Mark is that through Jesus, God invades and transforms the human present. Jesus displays the way of God's future through healings and exorcisms like this one, through radical teaching and breaking of boundaries. Jesus in the world is almost like a pocket of resistance a real presence of the actuality and substance of God's future in this present. Jesus shows us that the future can free us from the ways the present and the past possess us. When the news gets around town that Jesus has freed the man from his demons, well, people come to see what happened. The unnamed man is with Jesus. He's sitting calmly. He's in that precarious place when healing has started. His new life is about to begin, but right now he's kind of in between. Is that us? Jesus has come to us and healing has started. But sometimes the past, good or bad, and the ways it possesses us fights desperately against the future life that Jesus reveals to us. People of the town come to Jesus, and there the demoniac is, dressed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. Of course they are. They can understand being trapped by the past. That's, that's something they get. But now the unnamed man is a little pocket of the future, being freed from the past. That's something they don't understand. Jesus has a little bit too much power and it's scary. In a way, they are saying the same thing the unnamed man did. Don't torment us with change, Jesus. I get it. Because something in me connects with the graveyard. There's a part of me that's a lot more comfortable in the present age that's consumed by the influence and power of death than in Jesus' representation of future life that's so different from what we're used to. So Jesus, he acquiesces. He agrees to leave, but the man begs to get on the boat and go with him. And Jesus says, no. Remember last week, Jesus calling a woman a dog? Well, this verse bothers me even more. I long to get in that boat. And the idea of Jesus saying, no, stay here where you're constantly reminded of your past. Stay in the world of death, this graveyard. Well, that hurts. But when I think about it, I ask this question of Jesus, all the time. How long, O oh Lord? Why can't we just have that glorious future right now? I want to go with you. But that's 
Well, that's not our destiny as followers of Jesus. The man can't get in the boat and simply leave the borders of the narrative that's formed him, and neither can we. We live here. We live in a world that's in so many ways demon-possessed and murderous and self-destructive and sometimes hopeless. Even though that world can look like a well-ordered cemetery of the living dead. But this unnamed man has experienced the invasion of God into that graveyard. God has invaded the quiet order of hopelessness and the chaos of his imprisonment by it. God has left inside him a pocket of life and hope. The unnamed man can't leave the borders of his world, but he can be part of God's invasion into it. Go to your friends, Jesus says, Come to grips with what has been and the world in which you live and tell them about Jesus. And they will be amazed. This isn't a look at the pretty fireworks from a distance amazed, but a step back. This is scary, but I'm so drawn to it amazed. Why? Because as disciples of Jesus Christ, what we believe and how we live are in conflict with the powers of this world. How the powers live, how they force others to live. I wonder what kind of reception the unnamed man got in his community. Certainly, some people saw a miraculous change in him, something to praise and applaud. Well, what was he like? Was he joyful in circumstances that looked grim? Did he praise God no matter what happened to him and live a life of gratitude? Did he love radically and lift up others who lived in their own personal graveyards? Did he speak up boldly when things were happening that were in opposition to God? That kind of living, a pocket of the future life and hope in this graveyard world, well, that's amazing. Telling people what Jesus has done for us in real, gritty, honest ways which honor our past is amazing. Because the good news is that Jesus represents God's future in the midst of the present. The good news is that Jesus has left an empty tomb in his past and he is headed for a rendezvous here in our graveyard where this time he's breaking the future into the present through his disciples, us, all over again. While all we know lies in the past, all that we are lies in the future. That may be a reality that we can't yet imagine, but Jesus is telling us that it's more real than anything that's behind us. Jesus calls us to measure ourselves not by this world, but by something greater. Jesus calls us to measure ourselves by our love, our generosity, our self-sacrifice, our dedication to truth, our joy, and our hope. The ways that Jesus' life on earth disturbed those around him. We may be broken. We may be sometimes captured by the darkness of the world, but we too are summoned to be agents of God's future breaking into the present. Can you see that in your own life? Have you been freed by Jesus and compelled to go and tell your friends? It sounds so simple, because it is. Have you shown love and generosity that simply didn't fit expectations? Have people around you been amazed? Our destiny as disciples of Jesus, as those who have been freed from our legion of demons and told to go tell our friends, our destiny lies in seeing that future and realizing that future in our present. Our destiny lies in giving and receiving love beyond imagining. Our destiny is to recognize all the ways that God brings beauty into this world and join into that in gratitude. 
Our destiny is to always believe that things can be better. Our destiny is to live as citizens of God's reign here and now. Maybe our demons will howl. Perhaps they will tempt us to live quietly amidst the tombs and just fit in there. But we will not. Like this unnamed man, as disciples of Jesus, we will love and we will speak. We will tell what Jesus has done for us. We will be an invasion of future hope into this present world. May all who we encounter be amazed. Amen.
I've had several Kairos moments in my life, but none like the one I experienced at the very beginning of the pandemic, showing me that God is present, especially during difficult times. A little background about me is that my dad was in the Air Force, which meant that we moved a lot. My mom took my brothers and I to Catholic church services, sorry, on whatever base we lived at, rarely seeing the same priest more than once or twice. I felt mostly invisible growing up, yet this is where my faith began. My Kairos moment was a dream, or as I believe, a premonition of sorts. To start, I was to walk to a counter where a nun was working. My parents were watching from above her, smiling down at me. I spoke my name, thinking that I would not be known, but I immediately felt an overwhelming sense of love surrounding me. The nun handed me a gift, which was a stack of items, including a book. Next, I'm standing in an attached room with many windows, and I could see that we were on the water near the coast. Suddenly, a huge ship-like ves vessel splashes into the water. The lady working there says, oh, here comes another wave. Don't worry, we'll be fine. Then a tsunami-like wave washes over us, but our vessel doesn't move at all. I had the feeling of total safety. Finally, I was in another small room and I was supposed to buy a few groceries, but the shelves were almost completely bare. However, there was a small area which had homemade food samplings from different parts of the world, kind of like a mini Lutheran potluck. In the days following the dream, I began to clearly see its meaning. The book inside the gift was the Bible, representing the gift of faith which began in me as a child. The feeling I experienced of being known and loved was the love of God being poured onto me. The room with the tsunami represents the wave of the coming pandemic with all the knowledge that we won't be shaken, all is well. And the last room with the food samples from different parts of the world shows that the pandemic will be worldwide and there will be food and supply shortages and to prepare for that. As it says in Isaiah 41.10, so do not fear for I am with you. Do not be dismayed for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Good morning, my name is Noel Thompson. I'm the Director of Student Ministries here at Christ Lutheran Church. Today is Rally Day. Now what is Rally Day? Rally Day is a day where we celebrate the beginning of our Sunday school education classes for all students. So Deeper, Deeper is our youth ministry involving kids from seventh grade through 12th grade. Now Deeper will meet every Sunday either on Zoom or through Instagram Live. We will also be doing a midweek fellowship Zoom as well. Now today we're celebrating Rally Day by giving every Deeper student a planing mill pizza. It's pretty cool. Those kids really do love pizza. Now confirmation will be starting as well. Now if you have a seventh grader or an eighth grader or a ninth grader, you can be part of the confirmation class. Seventh and eighth grade confirmation meets every Wednesday and that will be starting by having a parent Zoom meeting this Wednesday, August 19th at 630. Now, if you have a ninth grader, we also have a special ninth grade confirmation class that meets once a month with Pastor Brian and I. Again, we will have a ninth grade parent Zoom meeting at seven o'clock this Wednesday. If you know any students in those age groups and that would love to join the confirmation program, it is never too late. Please call the church office at any time during the week. Now, Sunday school. Sunday school will be beginning to meet every Sunday as we always do after rally day. Now, because love is requiring us to meet at a distance, we have produced a very, very special thing called the Sunday School Show. Kids love watching YouTube and all sorts of videos. So we have produced our very own Sunday School Show. That's right, it's gonna be a lot of fun. Sunday School, our goal is for kids to experience the love and joy of God. And that's our goal with the Sunday School Show. So just to provide you with a little bit of joy, here is a clip of our Sunday School Show. Enjoy. This is all I want Not the love I have for you Doesn't fade along with you The reason that I ask 
Good morning. Welcome to today's challenge of the day, where every Sunday, every Sunday during our Sunday school show, we're going to have a challenge of the day. You know, this came about during summer adventure camp where I tried to break a world record every day. I was zero for five. But I'm pretty confident in today's world record. Today I have Miss Erin and Miss Lori. Miss Erin will be doing the challenge with me. Miss Lori will be doing the, the time for us. Okay, so today's challenge of the day, Aaron, is an applesauce. The world record to eat an applesauce, which is four ounces, is 7.16 six seconds. Yeah. Seven seconds. The record is to finish all of this in seven seconds. So we're going to bring it back to the summer of Richard Kent. The confident ranking, zero, like there's no way, 10 all day, every day. Before I saw this, I yeah. was at an eight. Yeah, I'm not gonna lie. When I and first now saw I realize a lot bigger than what I had in my mind. I'm gonna say I'm about a five. I swear they they increase the sizing. I'm a five. I'll, that's where I'm at. The confidence zero out of ten. I'm a five. What are you? Solid, solid three. Solid three. Lori, what are you for us? Or, or a five. Five for us? Yeah. Okay. So with a spoon. No trick is all of it. None of it can't fall on the table or. Or anywhere, all that has to with the swan all. Okay. So seven seconds. I can't even tell you the last time I had applesauce. I can't either. So, I'm nervous. Here we go. It's unsweetened applesauce, four <laughs> ounces. Challenge of the day. Place your bets now. Okay, ready? Yeah. On your mark. Get set. Go. Done! My 10.17. 10.17. Well, I'm not really done because I have some in my hand here. I don't have any on the table. I have some on the I don't table. Know what you have. And, uh, Pretty good. I thought I had it. I thought I had it. <laughs> you, well, when I heard your slow. I, I, so I was so like, close. Oh. I was like, you got ten, it. Oh, 10 We're seconds. Like so 10 seconds. Like, Aaron was a second or two behind. Well, that's scrumptious. Today, we didn't win the challenge, but next week, we'll see if we can win the challenge of the day. We'll see you next week. Heavenly Father, we desire that our children and students know Christ Lutheran Church as a place that welcomes, accepts, and loves them. We pray for our student ministry program during these unpredictable times. May we be effective in assuring students that even though they might not be able to be on our campus, we are available, always willing to come alongside them. Thank you for this congregation who values the future of the church and so invest in our students' future with finances, prayer, and love. God, we pray for students of all ages, especially those who struggle with the finality that they won't return to school in person this fall. We pray for daycare kids and preschoolers who are too young to understand why they can't be close to their teachers and friends. We pray for stories unread, songs unsung, playscapes unconquered, and the laughter of classroom parties unheard. Oh Lord, early childhood education is so vital. Somehow may these children still blossom this year. We pray for elementary students who will miss their classes and classmates. We pray for their sense of belonging and loss of joyful memories. Playing during recess, laughter shared at lunch, fun classroom projects, the loss of sports, play dates, and the rides on the bus. We pray for every middle schooler who will miss their networks, who will lose this time to share the transformation from child to teen. For those who have spent this year finding themselves as a musician, athlete, gamer, socialite, or scholar, and now feel stuck at home without a place to fully share who they want to be. We pray for our high schoolers who struggle daily to feel a sense of worth. May they be surrounded by people who pick them up by their acts of presence, love, and grace. For ninth graders who are not starting high school the way they always envisioned, for seniors missing the, the, the expected excitement of starting their last year of high school, we pray for the loss of band competition medals, dances, sports games not taking place, theaters not full of singing or building of props, 
and classrooms full of transformation. O oh Lord, as students of all ages face the uncertainties in the coming year, grant them strength to face every challenge, bravery to do their best, and hope for a better future. We pray for school administrators, teachers, technology staff, and all school employees. As this season has brought on so much change, with little time to adapt, we thank you for those who have stepped up and have risen to the challenge so all students can learn this fall. We thank you for their time and passion in putting students first. We ask your blessing on all distance learning experiences and pray that all teachers feel their worth, knowing that they can still make a difference from a distance. Oh God, grant them peace, patience, strength, and wisdom. Finally, Lord, we pray for vulnerable children, for families without options for childcare, for parents feeling ill-equipped, for students dependent on the structure of school in an otherwise chaotic life, for children with special education needs who may not be included in broad stroke electronic expectations, for male dependent children who may not eat, for those who experience unequal opportunity without access to technology and the internet. We pray for those who have lost their refuge, their champion, their squad, their family. In this painful time, O oh Lord, shelter us as Jesus promised you would. Here and now, help those who are broken by what is happening to live in the reality of their feelings, yet not be controlled by them. Help them to find a thread of hope, and may we do our part to be that strong thread leading always to your love and grace. God of changes love, thank you for providing ways to stay connected. Fill any emptiness and open our hearts to love all your children generously. For this and so much more we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who have sinned against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen.
And now receive the benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and grant you peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.